No, I don't think we do hold back salt. We hold back I salt, think for, but for we the do pizza, hold back sugar. For the pizza recipe, I think I think after the because we're gonna cut this part out. Pizzas. <laughs> Hey everyone, I'm Dan. I'm Joe. Magnifique. Uh, so we're pumped, we're, we're here, we're back for like episode two, I think, of Ask the Test Kitchen. Um, we've got a ton of awesome questions from you guys that we're gonna dive into. Um, we'll try and answer them. We'll try and answer any personal questions you have about Joe. Um, and Dan. Yeah. And Dan. And Dan. And Joe. Uh, but yeah, let's just dig right into it. Here. So. Uh, oh, this is a good one. You mentioned mm. it, you mentioned it before. So I don't know if you're clumsy or not, Dan, when you cook. Yeah, incredibly. Okay. Thanks All for right. bringing that up. Okay. So Rachel Naomi, eighty-four. She's either eighty-four mm -hmm. or she's thirty-five. One of those <laughs> two right. things. One of those two things. I'm assuming. I, or she's the eighty-fourth Rachel Naomi on on Instagram. Yeah, but I I think it's really funny that if she were eighty-four, because that means like she'd have to change. When, no, yeah, she'd have to <laughs> change it every year. <laughs> I don't know. It's possible. It is possible. Okay. Well, maybe, maybe she just creates a new a new name every year. Every year. It could be. All right. So Rachel Naomi. So, how do you correct too much fish sauce in a Thai curry recipe? Oh, all right. And this is a great question because it also expands to like yeah. not like other things that you put too much in. For sure. So I also like this question because it feels like this is a um, kind of like a nine one one call, and, <laughs> yes. and, and we're answering it like by um, carrier pigeon or right. you know, or not even no like by by horse drawn carriage. Um, so, so maybe she's. I don't know what ha I don't know what happened with dinner, and I'm sorry. It sounds like we probably <laughs> had um, a really salty uh, Thai curry. So, but uh, for next time, hopefully, or maybe you're just sitting there waiting. She's like. You should wait. Like this is going to be good. So I. <laughs> so it's really cold right now. But no. So um, salt. Salt is is a wonderful thing. We know that if you don't have too much enough salt in a recipe, like it's just it's not going to taste right. Um, it brings all the other flavors in the dish out. It's really really important. Again, if you go over the salt limit for you, and it's kind of a personal thing. Um, then it's going to be really hard to eat. And so I'm guessing that's what you're talking about is that it's too salty. If it's too fish flavored, that would be a little bit different issue that we can also talk about. So salt. Um, right. So it's kind of two parts to the question. Yeah. 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 So there are a lot of there's a lot of lore out there about how to remove salt from things. Like if you've over salted a soup, <laughs> people say to like throw potatoes Potato. in and cook no. them, and like that doesn't really work. So th there's nothing really that you can add that will just pull out salt and then you can get rid of. So that's not that's not going to be an option. One of the easiest ways to um, adjust for too much salt is to play with the amount of fat in your recipe. So, you know, if this is a Thai curry, you probably have some coconut milk in there. You could try adding more coconut milk, or if you have like a new can, take some of that cream off the top mm -hmm. and add it. So fat has this dulling effect on our sense of taste, right? right? And so uh, it'll actually kind of coat your tongue and, and, and make the salt taste less salty. Um, that's obviously only going to work to a point where you're going to end right. up with like the richest curry you've ever had in your life. But so I would I would play with that. I would tweak that a little bit. Um, you could you know play with acidity a little bit. That can have something of an effect there. But the easiest way, honestly, is to just like go up on everything a little right. bit. <laughs> like you know, so it's like you know if you're going to add a little more coconut milk, maybe a, maybe a little bit more of your aromatics and and kind of build a little bit more. It's like if you keep messing up and doing it, you're just going to end up with like <laughs> a the huge the biggest curry, the biggest curry you've ever seen in your life. Um, um, but that's kind of the, the easiest way to go there. I would say that if you know if it's tasting too fishy to you, that's going to be a harder thing. You're going to be trying to like disguise right. that with all these other flavors. So um, best bet is to next time start with you know a small amount and then just kind of add as you need to go. Um, fish sauce can go a long way. And another interesting thing about it is temperature has a big impact on how much you're going to smell fish sauce. So a lot of people mm. really like the taste of it. It's super rich and umami, but if your whole kitchen smells like it, um, it can not be quite as pleasant. Okay. Um, and so adding it, uh, you know, after something has cooked is, is a really good way to do it so that you're not right. volatizing all of the, all the fishy aromas. Um, so sometimes keeping it a little bit on the cooler side can be good there. Okay. All right. So now you can eat. Now you can <laughs> get yeah. ready and then heat it up again. Heat up the food. Oh, and heat it up again. Heat it up yeah. again, like, like cold. I mean, I've never had, I guess you could have a chilled Thai curry. Yeah, you right? could. Like, a, you like a vicious was. Thai, <laughs> thai vicious was. Yeah, Thai vicious was. That sounds great. Yeah, sounds good. <laughs> <laughs> a fishy, really fishy one. Yeah. Fishy, fishy, vicious was. Fishy, fishy, a fishy, a fishy, fishy was. Fishy was. All right, I think this is a good joke. Okay. Um, so this comes from Cindy Larson. Cindy. Cindy. Um, how do I substitute almond flour for regular flour? I'm assuming all-purpose flour. Um, is uh, is it a one to is it a one to one, and is that even possible at all? 
I would say, as a blanket answer to that, no, it's not. And that's because almond flour and regular flour are so incredibly different despite having 50% of the same name, <laughs> flour. <laughs> yeah, so flour is mostly carbohydrate with a little bit of protein, maybe 8, 10, 12% protein, and negligible fat, maybe a couple of percent. Whereas almond flour is something like maybe 70 to 80% fat with a little bit of protein and an even smaller amount of carbohydrate. So they act very differently. Right. And flour needs to be hydrated and it, it forms all these, if, if, if it forms a paste, it, it cre creates uh, a network of gluten. Um, uh, gluten. Gluten. I'm gluten. gluten. <laughs> <laughs> and with flour, it's just ground nuts. So if you were to put flour in water and we used to leave it for a, a, a little bit, you know, a paste would form that would thicken up as the enzymatic reaction from the autolyse happens. But with flour, it would kind of just create a little bit of a sludge where the flour drops to the bottom. So it depends what it is that you're looking to use it for. So for instance, if you're gluten free, you might, not want, want, might want to not use flour, but you still need, you still need starch to create um, a structure for your bread to hold together so that it still remains chewy. And so if, if, if it's gluten is the issue, then I would say go for a gluten-free flour blend, which has got things like rice flour in it, tapioca starch, yep. that basically give you the structure and the chew that you want from a bread. Other starches that aren't, aren't wheat, the aren't barley, wheat. they're not gluten-forming, but they, but they have that starch so they can you know, bind water and right. build some structure. Exactly, yep. but if you're trying to avoid carbs, because maybe you're on like a paleo, or you're on Atkins, or a keto diet, uh, I would say, you know, so you can't really use starch at that point, so you need to, turn to other things. And we found that almond flour alone is not a good substitute yep. for regular flour. So what you need to do, I mean, almost every time we did this, baked goods for things like muffins or bread, um, uh, or I think there were sort of two or three other baked goods where we, where we did We found a combination of coconut flour and almond flour so it really oh, gave, you, yeah, yeah. gave you something that like, approximated the crumb of bread. And it worked particularly well for muffins, actually. And so if you think about what they, they each give you, the almond flour gives you like a coarse crumb, gives you something st sturdy, hearty to bite into, and it's got a, a pretty nice flavor. Whereas coconut flour, too. and a lot of fat as well. Yeah. Coconut flour is very absorbent, even though you know, it's slightly higher in carbohydrates, but you need much less of it. So you end up, we ended up using a ratio of something like three to four to one almond flour to coconut flour. Because also too much coconut nice. flour yeah, yeah. Gives, gives a bit of an off flavor as well, like yep. imparts a flavor. So that, that sort of combination like, gives you a very good base level um, of like, what the fundamental structure of your baked good is going to be. But then beyond that, you still need something to hold it all together. And so for that, you need something like psyllium husk or um, yep. psyllium husk uh, or xanthan um, gum, gum works as well. Yep. Yeah, exactly. Yep. Or, or guar gum too. And that sort of gave you like a structure that enabled to trap all the moisture, yep. trap the air bubbles in there within the greater structure of the, the, the hearty bread. So That's awesome. So there we go. So if you're avoiding gluten, go for a gluten-free flour brand. ATK has one. You can also buy them in the stores. Uh, and if you're looking to avoid carbs, uh, you ca it, it's very recipe specific, but you're normally best using a combination of almond flour and coconut flour with some sort of binder, like xanthan gum, guar gum, or psyllium husk. Yep. There we go. That is, a is that what you wanted? Answer. Yeah, I mean, that's more than, more than I ever <laughs> expected to get out of it. That's, that's such a good answer, yeah. All right, so how, all right, this is an easy one. Okay. I think you can do this. How does one make a balsamic reduction to drizzle? To drizzle. To drizzle. Some of reduction to drizzle. Because, like, you know, because I guess she's not talking about like the aged stuff. You're talking about the stuff you yep. buy in the grocery store. It's it's kind yep. of thin. You wouldn't want to just pour it over, right? Right, like a steak or some mozzarella or something. Yeah, yeah. So uh, balsamic reduction. I mean, the craziest thing about this is this question is that like the the recipe is almost in the name. Um, <laughs> so at its most simple, you can take balsamic vinegar. And right. I would recommend getting like the cheap stuff from the store because. What you're gonna do is like, you're gonna reduce this down and that the house is gonna smell like a lot and all that stuff you're smelling is not gonna be in the, in the, right. in the glaze. So it's in your nose, not in your food. You're gonna drive off a lot of flavor. Um, so you don't need to start with something super expensive or complex and balsamic vinegar can get really pricey. So I would go for some cheap stuff. Um, and so the interesting thing about uh, vinegar is that uh, the acetic acid is really volatile. So that's why like if you're reducing vinegar on the stovetop and you, you, you're like get hit in the nose with mm -hmm. this, the, the sharp acidity. So, oh. what you, so what you're doing when you're cooking it down is you're driving off some of that. So you're mellowing it out. It's gonna be less acidic than, uh, than what you start with. And that's one of the big reasons that you're doing it. There's also a small amount of sugar in there. And right. so you're, you're concentrating that. 
And so what you end up with is you know, something that's obviously thicker, has less water in it. It's got less vinegar uh, sharpness to it, so it's gonna be more mild that way. And then the sugars are a little more concentrated, so you've got this kind of balancing sweetness to it. Um, so you can do it just vinegar alone, um, reduce it you know, basically uh, by roughly half is usually a pretty good measure. Mm -hmm. As it cools, it's going to set up a lot thicken more. Up. It's gonna thicken up. Um, but the big thing is you gotta do it pretty slowly. And the reason is, is you know, as the vinegar starts to drop down, there's gonna be some on the sides of the pan. Um, if you have a really high flame and it's kicking up the sides, you can tend to burn that stuff. Okay, right, and the sugar's gonna burn and turn a little acrid, I guess. Yeah, right. and it's gonna be kind of bitter and unpleasant. And, and that can just happen you know, if you just go a little too far. You, you can, so I would just go slow. It's also not gonna like make all that acetic acid hit you in the nose and like you know drive you away from the, your pan. So I would just I would take it and go slow. So start with like some cheap stuff, mm -hmm. reduce by about half. You know you could cool some down really quick in the in the freezer on a plate and see if it's the consistency you want. Right. Keep going. You know you can adjust that way. There are some recipes that add a little bit of sweetener, like a little bit of sugar to it, mm -hmm. which you totally can do. Um, but you can also sweeten it after the fact if it's not kind of what you're looking for. So um, balsamic reduction. Balsamic. Take the balsamic. The only recipe. Where the recipe is in the, in the name, name. <laughs> but it's a. It's but a you can do other things as well. I mean, maybe you could, you could add like if you want to say, for instance, you do what, exactly what Dan says, and you buy a really cheap bottle of balsamic vinegar, and it tastes terrible. Yeah. So you could like there are other things you could do to add little things to it. Maybe you could add like a little you could add a little wine, a little port to oh, it, totally. a little orange juice, yep. and, and actually, well, you very often see things like fig balsamic reduction, or yep. and so like you could add maybe like a sprig of rosemary to it as well. I love that fig idea. Like a dry, like a dried fig would be right. great in there. Yeah, yeah, it's true. And red wine I think is an, another nice one. And the same thing is going to happen. So if you add your add your red wine at the start, right, mm -hmm. and you cook it, right. you're driving off some alcohol. You're driving off, you know, that acidity is going to stay in there, but um, you're kind of just mellowing it out a lot. So that. Yeah, I think that'd be good too. So Joe's got so much better, <laughs> much better ideas. Much better ideas. I don't think so. All right, here we go. All right, what are we going to do now? Is it my turn? My turn to give one to you? Am I just doing all the talking though? Joe, is this a problem? Joe, that accent, are you kidding me? <laughs> you said the sweetest things, Dan. No one wants to hear my neutral, <laughs> not even Boston accent. Come on, man. Uh, all right, this is a fun one. Okay. Um, this one comes from. Mimo Alfano. Mimo Alfano. Mimo Alfano. Mimo Alfano. Um, it's a great name. Uh, so, Joe, what is your go to potluck recipe? My go to potluck recipe. <sighs> I've got to say, I, go, I, 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 I grew up not really going to potlucks because I didn't really grow up here or in New Jersey. What? I, I know they don't do shop. potlucks in, in Jersey. They don't do potlucks. Yeah, they don't do potlucks in Jersey. <laughs> Wait, so are you saying are you saying that um, in England there's no potlucks? No, isn't it? That, that was a term like potluck. Potluck is like you put your hand in the basket and you get something like a t prize or something. Like that's a potluck. In so in, in England, it, it, if you if you're like there's a potluck. You expect that you're going to put your hand in something and pull out a prize. Yeah, exactly. Like potluck. It's like it's like something like maybe a school fa fair, a fate. You you don't call them school fates, do you? Like the, a school like. No, school fate. Like, um, like, school. like, are you going to fail or pass? Like that no, kind of like. No, school fate is like it's going to be fundraising. There are like games, and you can like there's a raffle to like re re uh, retile the the spire of the local church. Those sorts of things. So if you win the raffle, you get to retile the no, spire. Of, <laughs> no, if you win, I don't the, understand. If you win the raffle, you get Any some you get some like prize that someone okay. donated that they didn't want anyway, but you give them money for it, so they've raised money for the for the steeple. Gotcha. So the local church steeple or, or the local school. The, the school needs more books. The school needs more. Okay. So, so at that, um, what do you call it? School fate. School fate. Yeah. School fate, which like is F F E T E, like oh fate, like yes. festivals. Uh, okay, fets. Yeah. Fets. Okay, fets. So, but, but, but at, at that, would people come from uh, other places and bring food with them to it to all share? Yeah. I, I, oh, that, that'd be a cake sale. There would be a cake sale. <laughs> be a cake They'd cake be sale. making victorious sponges. They'd be making oh, really sausage good. rolls, uh, pork pies. Pork pies. And so, but what if those things weren't sold, but were instead consumed by the people there? Okay. Uh, then you'd be stealing from the church and, and its roof. <laughs> All and right. So that's what a potluck is. It's stealing from the church. It's stealing from the church. It's stealing okay. from the church. Yes. So, um, wow. I didn't think this was going to be a hard question, because, uh, but I had no idea that you've never been to a potluck before. I, I, well, I've been, I, I went to my first potluck. Actually, last week. <laughs> Wait, really? It's true. It's true. And, it, and and I made and I made I made a cook science an old cook science recipe. Oh, the best. What one did you make? It was the stir fried eggplant. 
Oh, that's a really good recipe. That's stir-fried eggplant. And because it's, really it's a really fun one to do because it's vegan. And this is one with it's so much flavor. It's got fermented black beans in it. Yep. Uh, it's, it's got less, it's got poison, which again is a really like a powerhouse ingredient. It's yep. got a lot of fermented flavors. And you use loads of eggplant. So it's a great meaty vegan recipe. Man, you're so on brand. <laughs> I'm on brand. Like, and we have a vegan book too. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah. Um, wow, so your first potluck, like, you brought a, an eggplant stir fry. An eggplant stir fry. And it went down pretty well. I, I bet it did. I bet it did. I bet Mimo Alfano was not expecting a no. vegan eggplant side, but I think that's a really great one. Well, we, all right, what's your one? Come on. What's mine? I think you, w was that like a question you asked? Because like you want to be asked that question. Like, how are you doing? And you don't care how they're doing, you just want to tell them how you're doing. <laughs> I just wanted you to care about me, Joe. I wanted you to ask me. <laughs> well, I would bring to a potluck. Um, so, what do I bring to a potluck? I, I like I like big salad situations for potlucks. Nice. Um, I think so. I, I I always bring ice too. I always bring ice to parties and potlucks. Right, because it's because it's like you, you want to drink. It's lame having a drink. That's yeah. Weird. Always pick up a thing about. So in addition to that, um, Brussels sprout salad is a, is a one that I love to uh, mm -hmm. bring. Faro salad is also awesome. Um, but most recently, I've been bringing um, Spanish tortilla. Oh, so it's making, so good cold. Yeah, making Spanish so tortilla, good exactly. Cold. It's good room temperature. Um, make, some, make some mayonnaise or buy some mayonnaise if you don't want to. Um, and people, I mean, it's just awesome. It's like, there's an excuse to eat olive oil, which everyone wants with like a little eggy potato texture. <laughs> um, That's right. Yeah, exactly. You make it, you make it a day ahead. And then the time that you're transporting it uh -huh. there, it's like coming up to room temperature, and then right. it sits out, and it's the only thing on the table that's like improved. It's imp truly improved by sitting that's out. That's right. Yeah, I would say like my stir fry, like it deteriorated. Like a stir fry should be eaten fresh, really. So I don't recommend that doing for a stir fry. <laughs> so, but this is a much better idea. So don't don't do me. what Joe did. That's right. He's just learning. This is his <laughs> first. This is your first one. This is my first one. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Next question. All right. So, all right, this is, uh, I think this is for you. Okay. The, it's either Venny Gallivant or the New York Gallivant. Oh yeah, or the Gallivant. New York Gallivant. He follows me on, on Instagram. Hi, the New York Gallivant. Hi. So, when is it appropriate to autolyse versus not? Mm. Is it when salt is added? Is it, is it when salt is added with the yeast? With the yeast. When that's salt what it's added. saying. All right, that's a great question. So, okay. autolyse. Okay, what's an autolyse first of all? So autolyse is a, a short resting period of time when you're making a bread dough, right? So it, um, it's, it can be anywhere from 10 minutes. Um, I've seen them go up to like two hours in mm -hmm. some crazy applications. We usually center somewhere in like the 10 to 20 minute range in a lot of our recipes. Um, and it is a, a, is a, is a French technique um, that allows for gluten formation to start without kneading. So um, it was originally kind of developed because the kneading process, while it develops a ton of gluten, it can also kind of rob uh, bread doughs of flavor. Mm. Um, so the, the more you knead, the more action, you can heat up doughs and, and you, can, you can affect the, the flavor of the flour in, in some ways. Oh. It can also strain your machine, um, you know, if you're, doing, if you're doing a machine. So there's some good reasons to, to autolyse. Um, and it's actually, I mean, it would be appropriate for a lot of, a lot of bread doughs. Um, we tend to do it when a, a dough is going to need a lot of kneading or a lot of working to, de to develop gluten. So if it's going to be really enriched, it's helpful there. But so basically what you want to do is you want to mix your flour and your water. We often add the yeast to that as well. The things you want to definitely hold back are, um, are salt. Sorry, do we do that? Hold back sugar too. Okay. And, and I think that the sugar goes in at the beginning. We can, can I just look check. real quick? Does he not do it in his thin crust? Oil and salt is what we hold back. Okay. So the, the basic structure of doing an autolyse, so you have your bread dough, you've got your, all your ingredients meased mm -hmm. out. You're going to put your flour, your yeast, and your sugar is generally what we do. Mm -hmm. So that stuff's going to go into the machine, and you're going to mix it until it's just combined, right? So you've got okay. no kind of dry pockets of flour. Everything is hydrated. You're not trying to knead it here, right? You're just not trying to knead it. Just get everything combined, and then you let that sit. Again, you, generally around 10 to 20 minutes for mm -hmm. most of our recipes. And a really cool thing happens during that time. So you have these two proteins, gluten and gliadin, that mm. uh, start to unravel. <laughs> 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 and glide. They start to unravel and join up and start forming these networks of gluten. Then, okay. then with further kneading, you can develop into this amazing network that can trap gas and make all your breads beautiful and chewy. And so the two things that we generally hold back when we do the autolyse are salt and oil. Um, if we have a lot of sugar, I think we'd also probably want to hold that back. The things you're trying to do, the salt will compete with um, the flour for the water, right? So oh, we know that salt draws water out. into things um, or out of things, and so uh, you want to avoid having that in there. You want that flour to have 
as much chance as possible to go ahead and, um, and interact with, with that water and start to form the gluten. And so oil is also a thing, fats that you want to leave out because they're going to coat flour. So you want to just give it the flour, the water, and the yeast. Um, and, and some you'll see leaving the yeast out, we generally add it in. Mm. So let that sit for about 10 to 20 minutes. Um, and then you add in the rest of your ingredients. You want to make sure you remember to add the rest of your ingredients. Yes. <laughs> um, and then you do your kneading. And so it can shorten the kneading time significantly, um, you know, sometimes in half, sometimes even less than that. And um, you get better flavor in your final, final bread. So um, feel free to add an auto lease to anything you want. You can just walk down the street. At Autolese is everywhere you go. Autolese, Autolese, Autolese. It's definitely not going to do any harm, uh, harm to a bread. But if you know if you've got a really long kneading time, um, it, that would be, a, be, or you have a ton of sugar and a ton of other stuff in there. So I would recommend it. Is there ever a time that you wouldn't Autolese? Um, I mean, we definitely have recipes where you don't. Um, but I wouldn't say that there's. There, there's never a time where it's like, that will ruin your recipe to do an auto lease. You know, it's just going to cut down on the kneading time for the most part. Okay, auto lease. Pew, pew. Pew, pew. pew, pew. <laughs> <laughs> okay, next question. Uh, Is it time for me to give you one? Give me one. All right, let's do it. Uh, BCL2677. He wants to know, can we get matching tattoos? I think that's BCL and you. Matching tattoos that perfectly measure the ratio of rice to water. <laughs> Can you do that, Dan? I mean, so I have this weird policy where like, if anyone's like, "Can we get matching tattoos?" I have to say yes. <laughs> so, <laughs> yes. so unfortunately, yeah, yes. we so can we can do it. I'm actually are. fully tatted. Just I know, it's only where you can't see. Right. Um, so, so I love so that maybe, question. So maybe it's going to go on your like hair. No. Yeah. So so I think he's referencing that what's eating the episode about rice where we talk about um, the finger test. And oh, what's the finger test? So the finger test is everyone's you know has a really hard time cooking rice. Not everyone, but like I do. I do. Cooking rice can be tricky, even for cooks that are like really well experienced. They're like afraid of making rice on the stovetop, right? Okay. If you have a rice cooker. Kind of takes the guesswork out of it. It's a, it's a black box. It's going to worry about it, not you. Yes, exactly. And so, like on the stovetop, one of the big issues is like these rice ratios, which were people basically get tattooed on their body in culinary school <laughs> and like growing up, they're like, you know, it's a ratio of it's two to one for this type of rice and blah 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 for this type of rice. And and then you can there there are these universal ratios that you can double and do all this. And the truth is, it's it's not it's not true. It's so not true. It doesn't work. It just doesn't work, okay. especially when you try to double these things. And the reason is, is any water in excess of the amount that you're putting in. So you put it like a cup of water and a cup of rice. Okay. Anything over that in the ratio, it's there just so that it can like evaporate and go away, right? Because okay. you always evaporate water, and so rice will always absorb in like a one to one ratio by volume. And so that's why when you double ratios, you end up having way too much evaporation water in the pot. So it doesn't work that well. So if you see, you know, a lot of experienced cooks will, will put rice and water in a pot or a rice cooker and kind of level it out and they'll either put their hand on it or they'll put their finger in it and look kind of where the water comes. Oh. And that's the evaporation water, right? So like, and, and what they do is they figure it out with their pot and their water, their ratios, okay. and then they can add rice and water to that point, and it doesn't matter how much you make. So you can batch up and batch down. So it's really, really easy. So I, I was making the point in that video that like, I really want to get that tattooed on my finger. So it's like, I don't have to remember where it is. Like my rice, my rice line, I can like go anywhere in the world. I can make it, da, 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 put it in and see it. And now what, I What happens when you get, get old and like your skin sags and then it stretches and then you're making garbage rice for the rest of your life? The rest, the rest of your short life. I don't know. Well, we all regret the tattoos that we get anyway, right? So like, right. I, let's let's just be young. <laughs> let's get the tattoos. And then when we're older, we'll regret just, it. Or we'll just get a right. bunch of extra lines. We'll cross it out. Or you also have like live fast, all these die young, leave a beautiful corpse, and make great, Attacks and make great <laughs> rice, <laughs> rice for like two years, for like two years. <laughs> yeah, um, that sounds like a good plan to me. Okay, anyway. yeah. Um, all right, so yeah, so we'll reach out and figure out a time to get the um, matching tattoos. I'm kidding. Okay, how about this one? Um, so I feel bad for this person, and that's why I want to bring this one up. Okay, I think, I think you can probably help them. All right. So this is um, Debbie Sue Seven. Debbie Sue, hi Debbie Sue. Not Debbie Sue six or five. This is Debbie number seven. seven. Yeah. Uh, so Debbie Sue can't have anything aged, um, okay. which I'm still wrapping my head around what that actually means. That's like an amazing selection of things. But so we, we can center it a little bit more. She says cheese, vinegars, etc. Suggestions for substitutes. So I, I think we need to center this a little bit more around like cheese and some of like the fermentable things that add a lot right. of like savory quality things. I mean, it sounds like she's talking about things that are fermented, right? 
Because like cheese, yogurt. So I imagine like cheese, yogurt, yep. maybe alcohol, vinegar, yep. oh. chocolates. I'm so sorry, Debbie Sue. <laughs> like, but, don't, but don't, Debbie Sue, we've got you. No, you okay. do? Okay, all right. I, I, I think need to be able to help her. I, I think it's okay. <clears throat> I think Debbie Sue, I think all is not lost. So what's the opposite of something aged? Something fresh. Something fresh. And that's what I think you're <clears> going to do here. Because you need things that just really boost flavor. So people use things like soy sauce, Worcestershire sauce, cheese, vinegar, like balsamic vinegar, aged vinegars, to like add like a depth of flavor to it. Totally. Yeah, yeah. But another route you can take is freshness. And you, you'll do that with like loads of fresh herbs. You could do it with toasted nuts. You could do it with, um, you could do it with lemon zest. Like lemon, like citrus zest is such a great way to bring flavor yeah. to things. And you can even do it with a little bit of garlic. So a little, so like for instance, like salsa verde is fantastic here. Where, so salsa verde is just Italian or, or Spanish for green sauce and you do that by just taking a whole lot of herbs. You could do it with like parsley, cilantro, tarragon even. And what you're very often doing when you're adding these things is add like a meatiness. So like lots of charred meat but also charred vegetables as well. So that gives you a lot of depth of flavor yeah. as well you know, as it creates all these new compounds. Some of the sugars caramelize, the rest go through the Maillard reaction, combining carbohydrates with proteins creating this lovely beautiful brown browning that, yeah. that, that we love in our, veg, our roast veggies or our, yep. our, our seared steaks. Sorry, when you said herbs, it just threw me off. I haven't listened <laughs> to the rest of it. It sounds so much better. And salsa verde oh. sounds better when you say it too. Okay. Th those are all awesome suggestions. Okay. I think you totally nailed it. I mean, I think like fresh flavors are, are great. If you want those like savory things, I think that browning is such a good idea. I think, I mean, you had mentioned tomatoes uh, oh, right. earlier, which is like, they're um, umami bombs, right? They're so, they're so full of um, that kind of awesome savory quality that we get from things like cheese and, and miso right. and all this fermented stuff. And um, that's why people like ketchup. I feel like tomato season, mm -hmm. Debbie Sue, you should not leave your kitchen. You <laughs> need to be in your kitchen. Tomato season is for you, exactly. No, you no, no vacation. I know it's that. Preserving. 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 I, she's like on the other line, on the other end being like, uh, I don't like tomatoes. <laughs> yeah. But all your other answers help out, help okay. out there. So I, I love good. the tomato idea. That, that's awesome. a great one. On that note, should we finish? Yeah, let's finish. Um, cheer, cheers to answering all these questions. Cheers. I learned so much about you. I'm going to invite you to a potluck. <laughs> and I learned a lot about rice and tattoos and Dan's predilections. <laughs>